Hi students, welcome to part two of the chapter 14 lecture. Um, as I was trying to explain before in a succinct manner, there are ways that you can determine whether or not speciation has actually occurred according to the biological species concept, and this is a better representation of that process. So here we have time on the x-axis. This dashed line represents when populations represented by the orange lines became allopatric, so they were separated by this geographic barrier in the form of a mountain range. So over a period of time with this case here, we have the two populations maintaining um, separate status here, but then we have a period of time in which the populations again become sympatric. So perhaps they expanded their range to eventually meet up at the end of this um, geographic barrier, and now those populations are sympatric once again. If the populations can actually interbreed and produce viable offspring, we have a merging of their splinter population gene pools, and no speciation has actually occurred. So they were separate for a period of time, but then when that geographic barrier was removed, they could still interbreed. That means that they're not separate species. With this lower case here, we have the same geographic barrier, but then when the populations become sympatric again, you still have independent trajectories of these arrows. The populations cannot interbreed. This represents true speciation. So reproductive isolation has occurred, even if those two species are in the same area, both temporally and spatially, they're not going to be interbreeding. And that represents when speciation has actually occurred. This is an example of polyploidy in, in plants, which I mentioned in the last lecture segment. And it basically tracks the advent of modern bread wheat, which has 42 chromosomes. So in the past, we had a domesticated triticum species. Triticum is the genus name for the wheat, and it had 14 chromosomes. It was crossed with a wild triticum species, with all, which also had 14 chromosomes. And the offspring represents hybridization. This particular um, cross was not successful because the species were different enough, despite the fact that they had the same number of chromosomes, that the offspring are sterile. So the chromosome sets were not able to pair successfully at meiosis, and that made the hybrid sterile. However, an error in cell division and self-fertilization resulted in a new species. And that new species um, was emmerwheat, which has 28 chromosomes, so we had a doubling of the number of chromosomes here. Emmer wheat, in turn, hybridized with a closely related species around 8,000 years ago. So this wild triticum species here with just, <coughs> excuse me, 14 chromosomes. And it produced another sterile hybrid with 21 chromosomes. <coughs> so the sterile hybrid, this sterile hybrid gave rise to modern um, bread wheat with two each of the ancestral set of chromosomes. So it ended up with 42 chromosomes and this genotype at those particular loci. You may be wondering what the pace of speciation is. So how fast does it occur? And I'm not gonna tell you any specific numbers because it varies so much with different species, but there are a couple of patterns that are recognizable not only in the fossil record, but in um, real time as scientists are studying evolution in both lab and field settings. So one of these patterns is the punctuated pattern, in which a new species develops relatively quickly with sudden changes occurring soon after speciation begins, as shown here. And then the species remain relatively unchanged over long periods of time. In contrast to that, we have the gradual pattern, in which new species diverge gradually as changes accumulate intermittently. So here we have an original butterfly population, and 
whether through allopatric or sympatric speciation, and depending on various selective pressures, we have two splinter populations taking off. One of those develops into um, a butterfly with the same pattern but different colors, um, primarily orange and red coloration, and then another population develops into that same pattern but with black and white coloration. I'm going to talk a little bit about the evolution of biological novelty. And by bi biological novelty, I just mean that any advent that arises in the biological evolution process that is new or novel. Remember that macroevolution is evolution that occurs above the species level. So when we think about the megafauna of um, North America, as in woolly mammoths and giant ground sloths, etc., we're usually we're usually um, inadvertently thinking about macroevolution. So this incredible diversity that arises through long periods of time. In contrast to macroevolution, of course, we have microevolution, with which are smaller scale changes that occur within species and within populations. Biological novelty is the adaptation of old structures for new functions, and structures that evolved in one context but become adapted for another use are known as exaptations. Feathers in birds is a great example of an exaptation because it is the current um, research indicates that dinosaurs first evolved feathers as a thermoregulatory mechanism, as in it was a alternative to fur for insulative purposes. Gradually, those um, feathers were actually co-opted for a completely new purpose as populations took advantage of um, insect populations and other food sources in the air that they could not access on the ground. So a structure can gradually change to allow for novel or new functions, but it's important to keep in mind that it doesn't initially evolve somehow anticipating it being modified for another use. Um, so again, when feathers first arose, there was no way for evolution to be forward-thinking. It wasn't as if feathers evolved anticipating that they could later be used for flight with further modifications. It was simply an adaptation that worked at the time. And Richard Dawkins has written a book on evolution entitled The Blind Watchmaker as a reference to this concept of um, biology, or rather evolution not being um, forward-thinking. Evo-Devo is a shortened term for evolutionary developmental biology, and it's the study of the developmental processes in multicellular organisms. Changes in the developmental processes of organisms, such as changes in the number, nucleotide sequence, and regulation of homeotic genes, have led to a diversity of body forms. Um, Homeotic genes are master control genes that control a large portion of an individual organism's development. So for example, the set of genes that give rise to a fruit fly's wings. So changes in how genes are expressed likely led to the evolution of tetrapods from fishes. So the, the genes themselves existed, it was just a change that occurred in how those genes were actually expressed or how those genes were manifest in the actual phenotype that likely led to this evolution of tetrapods. And one of the most famous um, missing link fossils is known as Tiktaalik rosier. This is a transitional fish tetrapod animal that lived in the late Devonian period about 375 million years ago. And Neil Shubin is the paleontologist that um, discovered this fossil and first described it, and he has written an excellent book called Your Inner Fish 
which has also been turned into probably the best biological science theme documentary I've ever seen, <laughs> which is also called Your Inner Fish. Um, there's three hour-long specials. Um, I believe they were produced by PBS, but there's the first one is called Your Inner Fish, the second is called Your Inner Reptile, and the third is called Your Inner Monkey. Um, again, if you're at all interested in evolution, I really encourage you to Google Your Inner Fish and um, watch these documentaries if you can because they're extremely well done and they take a lot of the concepts that I've talked about and basically explain them in a more eloquent fashion with with some really amazing um, pieces of evidence. Patamorphosis is the retention into adulthood of features that were solely juvenile in ancestral species. And an example of this is the salamander species known as the axolotl. Just like frogs develop from eggs which develop into tadpoles that slowly grow limbs and become adult frogs, salamanders do the same thing in their development. Um, however, there are some exceptions to this rule and the axolotl is one of those exceptions. So this is typically what you would think of as an immature or larval salamander looking like, but this is actually a sexually mature adult axolotl and it has still retained the gills that were present in the larval form, and it goes through its entire life um, basically looking very similar, but just growing in size. Another example of patamorphosis is how our own skulls show um, characteristics that look more infantile. So similarities are more apparent between fetal human and chimpanzee skulls than adult human and chimpanzee skulls. So what we have here is a chimpanzee fetal skull and a chimpanzee adult skull, and you can see that the shape of this skull changes very drastically. So there's development of this um, brow over the eye, there's a very strong development in the rostral or nose region, and a very strong shift in the development of the jaw. Now with our own skulls, they don't change nearly as much. Our skulls change more so in size than in structure. So we have a reduced um, rostral area and basically a weaker jaw and not nearly as much development in the teeth as chimpanzees do. So this is just an example of how um, patamorphosis works. It's basically just this retention of juvenile-like characteristics. And in fact, um, this concept can also be related to modern dog breeding in the fact that a lot of breeds have been developed as companion dogs to look more like puppies throughout their life span. So Shih Tzus, uh, Las Apsos, Pekingese, um, particularly the brachycephalic or short-nosed dog breeds such as Boston Terriers and Pugs, they retain a lot more of the juvenile characteristics than some of their more natural looking counterparts like Huskies and German Shepherds. Which there's a theory that that basically, well it's not a, <laughs> there's not a formal scientific theory, but a lot of people have proposed that the reason these particular breeds are so popular is that they look more human-like Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start with Earth history and macroevolution. As I've said before, the fossil record is the sequence in which fossils appear in rock strata, or layers. And the fossils in each stratum of rock are a local sample of the organisms that existed during the time period in which that layer was deposited. The most common method of telling absolute or exact ages of fossils is radiometric dating, which is based on the decay of radioactive isotopes, such as carbon, potassium, and uranium. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and pause here and I will finish up in the next recording.